My name is Mark F. Moran. I'm the founder and sole employee of Mark F. Moran Appraisals of Antiques and Fine Art, and I'm from Iola, Wisconsin. Well, I think like a lot of people, I started out as a collector back in the 1970s. My wife and I started collecting, and you know, when you first walk into an antique shop, and I had never been in an antique shop before, uh, you know, it's all sort of spread out before you until you train your eye to spot what it is that appeals to you and figure out why it appeals to you. So I started out as a collector in the 1970s. In the 1980s, I became an antique dealer part-time. My full-time job was as a newspaper man. I worked at newspapers in uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin, and also in Rochester, Minnesota for many years. And then in the 1990s, I had a chance to combine those two different skill sets of the, the writing and editing side with the antique side and I started writing antique reference books and I've written 27 books on various uh, antique and collectible categories and they've all been, uh, they were all very popular and they're all now all out of print. Uh, so the books I wrote on collectibles have themselves become collectible, which is something I never expected. Uh, so, over the course of the last 40 years, you know, writing about antiques, buying and selling antiques, and now appraising antiques full time, I've, I've gotten uh, some pretty good contacts and, and a lot of good information that I can tap into for these programs. Uh, no matter how many of these programs I do, I never know how much I know until I'm presented with a question or a puzzle or a challenge. So. Let's see how much I know. Hi, what did you bring me? A vase. And I'm not as interested in appraisal as I wonder why people would put a donkey on a vase. <laughs> it is. It is a vase that is, that is profusely, and I just want to make sure everyone can see this, Carolyn. If you just want to stand right over there, thank you. Um, it is. It's decorated. There's a boy and two donkeys, and then there's just one lone donkey standing on the back. It's, it's actually beautifully done. How, how did it come into your life? My grandmother. Okay. It. It's hard to tell, but it looks like it's a transfer decoration, and it's very clearly marked on the bottom, Royal Beirut, Bavaria. Um, if, if you're going to have a vase, that's a pretty good name to see on the bottom of it, Royal Beirut. They made really fine porcelain objects, vases, and plates. Of course, if it was really valuable, it would be a vase. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Let's see. We'll see what we can, we'll see what we can find here. I, you know, again, every, every one of these programs I do, um, I, I see something that I've never seen before. I've seen a lot of Royal Beirut vases, but never one with a donkey. And again, this is a transfer decoration. So the design was laid on like a decal uh, without, without any, you know, without being hand painted. Oh, that's the right way to, oh wait, wait a minute, that was okay. Son of a gun. There's a whole line of them. There it is. With the same boy. So a little bit different shape, but the same basic. Ba here's one of three photos. Let's see. There's the lone, there's the lone donkey all by himself on the back. Um, and there's the Royal Bay Ruth Mark in blue on the bottom. Very nice. Very nice. So what does it say about it? Royal Bay Ruth Boy and Donkey Vase. <laughs> we do <knew> that. <laughs> uh, Sixty-five dollars. It sold for seven years ago, and that one was only about four and a quarter inches high. Let me go back here and see what else they have. Um, so the same motif shows up on. Here's a one with a handled vase, forty-five dollars. Here's a here's a ovoid vase, 
Here's another one right here. So there's a few of them out there, and here's, it shows up on a little, looks like a creamer. This whole group, and there he is. Um, and here's a couple with some, like, big, they look like Scottish bulls, and some heavy horses, like, that looks like a Belgian and a Percheron. That whole collection right there sold for 200 bucks for everything eight years ago. Uh, at a good, at a good uh, Cedar Falls, Iowa auction company, Jackson's, Jackson's International. They do a good job. So, so I would say it's in wonderful condition, um, and it's clearly a, a pattern that is a style that Royal Beirut did a lot of. Um, that little one that sold for, that's what was it, sixty-five dollars. I'm going to say that this is about an eighty, maybe a hundred dollar base. Very nice. Thank you for bringing it. This is a Havlin, France, and it's especially made uh, for the House of Stewart in New York. Wow. And I don't know what this is. Okay, I can tell you exactly what it is. <laughs> okay. So I'm so glad you brought it. <laughs> So this is a, let's just show people here. There's this little divider, and the divider goes in the bottom right here. And of course, it's, it's a covered butter dish. Is it really? It is. Um, you often see these in glass. So to see one in ceramic like this is, is kind of interesting. Um, again, it's a, it's a combination of hand painting and transfer but if, to still have this piece surviving is fairly remarkable. Because what they did, they put ice cubes, crushed ice, underneath there. And then they put this, this little divider in there. And then they put a big glob of butter right on top. And so the ice would keep the butter cold, but it wouldn't get it wet. Mm -hmm. And then they would cover it up for this. And it says so right here on the inside. It says decorated by Haviland and Company, made expressly for the House of Stewart, New York. So uh, uh, retailers and businesses could order these custom-made from Haviland. Theodore Haviland was an American who went to France, to Limoges, to establish his pottery. He was outrageously successful. And, and um, he, he, the big part of his business was making you know, custom-made and customized ceramics for uh, uh, American businesses. And they would give these out as premiums. Uh, this would have been part of a really lovely breakfast set um, that probably included a creamer and a sugar and a waste bowl that would have it would with the tea bags and the grounds and things like that. Maybe a spooner okay. to hold spoons. But the, the, this name um, the House of Stewart, I was I have never seen before. So let's just see. Let's just go with the covered butter and see what happens in this particular database. So there is a lot of them, a lot of covered butters. Now, is this an orphan? I mean, it's not part of a larger set. Well, I have I have a Haplin uh, dishes from my mother okay. that, I, that I have inherited. Okay. You know, this is a really, really lovely design. Uh, do you think we can find another one here? That looks just like it. So obviously there's a lot of Haviland covered butter dishes out there. Okay. One, the one that I was just looking at, that sold for $39. I think you can, I think you can um, extrapolate that. Here's a really pretty one. The Mo Schlager three-piece butter dish. So this also includes. There it is, right on the inside, right there. Now Schlager, I think, is also the name of uh, a retailer rather than the manufacturer. Now when did this sell? Two years ago. I, I am I am stunned that it brought that much money. Uh, but this, I think, is the key right here. Okay. And you can imagine that this was the piece that just did not survive. Mm -hmm. So two years ago, this one sold for 250 bucks. 
you know, I, I'd like to find one more here before I, before I commit myself. But it looks like, I mean, here is a, here's another gorgeous set. And there you've got the teapot, the creamer, the sugar, and, and, a, and the, this is the Eden pattern. That sold for $600. There's that same one they offered it for sale, $250, and the sale must have not, must not have gone through. You know what? Um, I'm going to say, and then and yet here's one for 10 bucks. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm going to say probably around $100. Uh, this is a really beautiful one. The gilding on it is, looks like it's, ne it's never been touched. You know, there is no wear on the gilding on the handles. Um, so. So do they usually use like, um, like 24 karat gold? On they the do. Oh, okay. yes. Um, but, you know, if you scraped every single bit of gold off of there, there wouldn't be enough to fill a tooth. Mm -hmm. it's, just a t it's just microns thin. So okay. it, that component doesn't add a whole lot of value. It's the condition of the gilding, which is absolutely untouched, mm -hmm. that, that adds value. I would say at least 100 bucks. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I, I have more fun at these antique appraisal events. Than, than anyone else. And part of the fun and part of the challenge for me as an appraiser is walking into a room with you know, 40 or 50 or 60 or 100 uh, items uh, that I've never seen before and drawing on my own background and also using uh, about one of a different, uh, half a dozen different databases uh, that I, on the internet that I use, uh, helping people to understand the history and use and value of, of their treasures. And, and sometimes people will come in and say, gosh, I've been looking for this on the internet for you know five years and I can't find another example. And it takes me about 10 seconds to find another one. But, but as an appraiser, it's really speaking about speaking that language every day. Uh, speaking the language that accurately describes antiques and collectibles, whether it's glass or ceramic or carving or fine art or toys or clocks or metalware or any of the other you know, dozen or so categories that, that people bring into the events. It's really about speaking that language. So to, to narrow down the focus, so when you do an internet search, you only get the, the information that you really need. I'd like to know what you can tell me about this. Well, I'll do my best. I've only seen one other example of okay. this. Okay. Five years ago, okay. In, uh, Park, California, at you, an antique show. Okay, you've got some good duct tape on the top. Red Green would be proud of that taping job that you have done there. <gasps> Pretty, and you have the lid. You do have the lid. Yes. How did I know that there was going to be a lid? However, okay. it originally had four little sauce dishes. And about 60 plus years ago, my oh. mother-in-law broke one. Okay. I do have three. Okay. Very nice. Very nice. Um, so as a category, they would call this... Uh, they abbreviate it, they call it EAPG, which stands for Early American Pattern Glass. Interesting. And, um, but with the blue decoration on there, and you can see the variation, this is a pretty intense blue, and this is a little bit more, you know, a little bit more of a faded blue. So we have a covered compote and individual little, I suppose, berry dishes or sherbet dishes. But I, normally you wouldn't have a master berry, uh, you know, bowl or compote with a lid. So that's unusual. That's very unusual. I saw a sugar and a creamer. Okay. In that particular. That seems... And they all have crazy names. They all have crazy unusual names for these various patterns. And, it, and this is... Button, isn't it? It's the what? Daisy and, Daisy and Button is the one of the most popular and, and, and the best known. Um, uh, but it's not cut glass, of course, it's molded. No, it's 
and you can feel it, you know if you picked up if you pick up a piece of cut glass it, it'll be painful it'll, because the edges will be so sharp right, you can feel okay so then you know what I'm talking about yes. and what, what's interesting though is what you can see right there in the bottom of that see that little that little line there yeah. they call that straw collectors because it looks like it looks like someone has come along and sprinkled wisps of straw and that happens when there's a little tiny flaw in the in the mold or you know they're because they have to be heated up uh, before the glass goes into them and and sometimes you know little there are little striations and little lines and so collectors call that straw so we have a I think you're right I think it's a, it is daisy and button and it's a covered compote now some people call this a comport but I think compote is the right word rather than comport so what do we have here we'll have to go the, the, the uh, pardon we'll have to go out to the you have to go to the unabridged to see what what I they say about finished. that say about that now this one I think is in all blue No, this no no no. This is Jeffrey. Uh, no 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 no. This is not a reproduction. Oh, I know. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, this is Jeffrey Evans. This is my buddy Jeffrey Evans out in Mark, Mount Crawford, Virginia. But you can see that the same blue, the same pattern in the corners, these same circles right yeah. down the yeah. line. Yeah. 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 So you've got an amber panel with a thumbprint. It doesn't look like a thumbprint to me though. But that's what they call these. They call these thumbprints. Um, yeah, see, these are late 19th century, so they're not from the 20th century. So 50 bucks for the pair, that was two years ago. And this is the larger, larger uh, uh, one, it's a nine and a half. That one actually looks a little taller than that. But that's it right there, but in all blue. So now we know that it is daisy and button with a thumbprint panel, amber stained rather than the, the blue stain. Let's see what else we have out there. And again, it's squared. Now, what is this one? This is also amber stained. Yeah. Is that the same one? It is. It's it the, is. It's, it, it's the exact same one, yep. but in amber. Know. Right. You can okay. see these little, yeah, you can see the thumbprints coming down there. 25 bucks. So can I ask what you paid for this? I inherited. Oh, you aired, and and what did you see? You saw another one in an antique show, for how much money? Do you remember? I don't. Okay, um, you know, they're beautiful pieces of glass. We now know that it's the Daisy and Button thumbprint from about 1880. That figures because great 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 grandmother emigrated from Sweden in 1871. Okay, there you go. So, so, but the fact of the matter is that today, if you, if you can't put it in the microwave and you can't put it in the dishwasher, you know, uh, you the, China the, the China, well, that's where people keep it. They, it just stays in the China cabinet. Now, there's a really nice Fenton uh, Daisy and Button. Yeah. Same one in Vaseline glass. That's the, the Vaseline. And if we get a piece of Vaseline glass in here, I was hoping that the first one we had was Vaseline, but it wasn't. That's what Vaseline glass looks like. So um, I would say for the, this pair and the surviving, you said three of them? I, probably a hundred and a quarter for all of them, I would say. Because I, while these are more common, believe it or not, these are not. I know I've looked for one. Yes, I'll be. <laughs> They're still out there. If, if you sit, take a picture of that and contact my buddy Jeff Evans out in Mount Crawford, Virginia, and say, Mark Moran sent me, he'll say, who's Mark I'll Moran? No. no. <laughs> he'll, he'll, he might be able to give you some more information about that particular pattern with the blue stain. Because I think the amber stain is more, pop, more common than the blue. Apparently. I think so. You also find it in ruby stain. You know, people always ask me about uh, what it's like to be on Antiques Roadshow. And as I mentioned earlier, I, I love doing Roadshow, but it's a long day. 
uh, you know, we have to be on the set at 7.15 in the morning, and we seldom get done before 7.30 at night. So if you imagine this for 12 hours with 8,000 people, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a busy day. Um, and by, by the end of the day, we're all pretty much, you know, our minds are all mush. We can barely order drinks. <laughs> but we managed to order a lot of drinks. Is it pretty warm on the set then because of the lights? No, not on us. I mean, in this, if, you, if we had to stay in the center where they're always shooting, yeah, it would stay pretty warm. But for us on the tables, and if you know, you watch, we're all sitting in tables, ring the, ring the area. Every once in a while, someone will come up to me and they'll say, I've got something that absolutely has to be on Antiques Roadshow. And I say, that's great. Put your name in and hope that they draw it out because it's a lottery. The, the tickets are free, um, uh, you know, and it doesn't matter when you put your name in. You could put your name in the day after that, the, that window of ordering tickets opens, or you can put it in the day before it closes. It doesn't matter. Uh, if they don't draw it out, that they don't draw it out. It's just strictly a lottery. Um, although, every appraiser does get four free tickets. So be nice to your appraiser. <laughs>
There's a lot more than I thought. This one is by Sarah Sachs. This one was made in 1916. Sarah Sachs had a completely different style. And this one was only 11 inches tall and sold in, two, in September, two months ago, for $5,000. OK, so we'll go back here again. So they liked to use the peacock motif a lot. These all have some kind of some kind of element. There's a good one by by Sarah Sachs. So I want to I want to try this. I want to do one more qualifying and limit this just to Lincoln bases. Okay. So so she was not quite in general in the same league as Sarah Sachs. Here's one a seven inch tall one that sold for thirty seven hundred dollars. It's only half the size. Here's this one again that we saw before. Or that was 1600 Now, again, we're going back in time. So the, well, the further back in time you go, the higher the values are. Ten years ago, this one sold for three grand. So, so I think it's safe to say, I just want to see how big this one is, even though, the, even though the, this is just an eight-inch face. It's half the size of this one. And it's sold for 550 bucks. Du Michel sold it last year. They're in Detroit. And I don't think that the, the work on this one is nearly as wonderful. I'm going to say two to 3,000, I would think. Um, I would love to be proved wrong. The glaze is a little bit, has turned a little bit. I mean, it's a little bit crackled, although that may have been part of the original design. This is the vellum glaze. It's a little bit dirty, but there's the mark. There's the Rookwood mark with the R, right. with the sunburst around it. Mm -hmm. On the bottom it says XXI, and then it says E14C, and then there's LNL for Elizabeth Lincoln. Okay. So what a fabulous piece. Thank Thanks you. for bringing it. You're welcome. Okay. That was wonderful. <laughs> We're on the northern coast of Northern Ireland, and you're looking out over the Atlantic Ocean, and you're watching QCTV. What'd you bring me? It's um, antique tapestry. Oh my, okay. That I believe my father-in-law brought back from Germany after World War I. Okay, so I, I see a lot of these in my programs, but seldom do they look as good as this one. Um, most of the ones I see, the colors have just completely faded away. Uh, the reds that you see in here, that's the last color to go. And you can see by looking at the back, you know, they were usually very, very bright when they, when they uh, wove these, uh, looking at the negative image on the back. These are, these are machine woven. Uh, they usually on the back, they'll say, made in France or Italy or Belgium. Does it say that here? I don't see anything. On he the was back. in Germany. He was in Germany. Um, usually France or Belgium is what I see the most of. Um, so these, were, these could, were often brought back by the GIs. They are usually framed um, in like on metal stretchers. Uh, it looks like this has been folded up for a long time, which probably explains why it's in such great condition. Um, and again, the, the, most of the ones I see are just faded, all the colors, it's just like a, this tan, like dry grass. So there's, there's no color left. This one is in really, really good shape, but it's a fox hunting scene. Mm -hmm. And you've got, you know, the horses and the dogs and, and a, you know, a, the, the, the happy hunters, male and female, riding to, riding to hounds. Um, because of the condition and because of the size, it's about twice the size in length of most of the ones that I see. Um, if you wanted to have this frame, and you could sh certainly do that, you could have it mounted on linen and they could put it on a stretcher. And you could frame it just like any other piece of wall art. Um, 100 and 110, 125 bucks probably. For the framing? Uh, no, for, for the value for this. Oh. Yeah. 
it, it, is, it is so unusual to see one of these, which is now 75 years old, uh, uh, in this good a condition. World War I, I think. Yeah. Oh, World War I. Oh, okay. Well, then it's 100 years old. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful piece. Thanks for bringing that. Hey, I'm just leaving now. Can you text me the details? Thanks. Here we go. With the certificate of authenticity on the back as well. Okay. So there, there is a an image of a of a of a really colorful, wonderful, but it, and and it's by Picasso. I've I've heard of him. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I've I have heard of him. And how did you get this? Uh, a friend of mine actually gave it to me. Oh well, that was nice. So this is what's called a gicle. So a gicle is actually produced with an inkjet printer. Oh. Uh, and and on the back, it has the certificate of authenticity titled "The Dream." It says it's a gicle. Total number in the edition is 500, and this is number 440. So this is the Picasso masterpieces. So someone has written in pencil down here, collection, uh, domain, Picasso. So it wasn't, it wasn't Picasso himself who signed this. But if you look at the image really closely with the magnifying glass, and it's beautiful in a beautiful gilt frame. If you look at it real closely, you can see that there is a fine, fine dot matrix. Okay. And that's the hallmark of a of a gicle. This may have actually been framed originally in the 1980s. Does, oh, wow. Is that possible? Could be. The reason I say that is that if you look at the edge of the mats here, mm -hmm. you see how they're just kind of starting to turn yellow? Just a little bit, yeah. just a little, yeah. or tan? Yeah. Yeah. That may be an indication of, of what they call mat burn. Okay. And mat burn happens when you have a mat that is not archival. It has a high acid content. And it okay. will tone or discolor uh, uh, the, the paper underneath it. So the question is we have to figure out. It was a wonderful gift. Mm -hmm. We have to figure out if it is of sufficient value. And maybe that doesn't really matter if you want to continue to to take good care of. Do you sure. display it in your home? I do. Good. I do. Good. Sometimes people come to these programs and they're really asking permission. They're bringing in something that they don't like. Oh, okay. <laughs> and they're really asking for permission to, to go back home, go to the basement door, open it, and throw it, whatever it is, <laughs> down the steps and close the door and never look at it again. So I'm glad to hear that this isn't one of those times. No, no Good. not at all. Good. Good. So um, we have a Picasso gicle of the dream. I have to make, make sure I spell Picasso's name correctly. There we go. Um, there is a lot of them out there. Okay. I can tell you right now. Okay. And when they often, often when they come up for sale, and here they are. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you can see, here's one for 60, here's one for 300, here's one for 310. These were all offered for sale this year. Now, what I want to add one more thing is in pencil, because I want to add the pencil notation and see if that'll no that narrows it down to 35. 
so we have the same exact penciled notation. Well, we can do that one. There it is. Mm -hmm. So Picasso Estate Collection Domain, that's what that is. Collection Domain. Okay. Je Clay titled The Dream, hand said 10 by 17. <laughs> now, um, 10 by 17. It looks a lot bigger because it's in a much right, a big, right. beautiful frame. It's a fabulous frame, yeah. actually. Um, paper measures 12 by 8, 12 inches by 8 and a half inches. This is actually a little bit bigger. So full margins, that's a good thing. They haven't right. trimmed it down. Um, you know, they were estimating it at six and a quarter to 700 bucks. That's way too much. Okay. There are so many of these out there. Um, it says they were limited to 500, but really it's the, the only limits they, they put on them are until the press breaks down. You know, uh, yeah. they yeah. just, they just, it's like printing money. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, there's another one that sold in April for $65. That other one we saw was 60 That was one sold for $90. Um, but as you see, most of them have gone unsold. Here's another one for 60 Two of them sold for 90 I would say, and then you go, here's one with a different, slightly different frame. 270. What the heck happened there? Uh, limited UK. Oh, it's on. It's on canvas. Oh, so wow. it's actually printed on canvas. Okay. So, a okay. little more money. Right. So I would say, um, it's a it's a lovely it's a lovely print. Great. Sixty or seventy bucks. Okay. okay. Sounds great. Thank you very much. Thanks for bringing it. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, you know, I haven't been in any, in any of the antique shops locally, but I do like to visit uh, shops and group, you know, uh, antique malls when I'm in a community, just to see what kinds of things they have, what kind of price points they have, you know, what's, find out what's moving, what's not moving. Um, as you may know, the antiques trade has had a, a tough time the last 15 to 20 years with, with many of the prices declining in value and um, so sometimes when people come to the program there they have certain expectations for values and and I wish I could tell them that the, uh, the values of all antiques and collectibles just continues to go up unfortunately they do not um, but most of the people who come to the events really aren't interested in what their treasure is worth they just want to know especially in the case of something that's come down through the family that they that has passed from one generation to the next they just want to know if the story is true that they've heard and sometimes it is and sometimes the story kind of grows in the telling uh, over the years a woman came into a program I did a few years back and she had a little German chocolate pot ceramic chocolate pot that that her family history said had once uh, poured chocolate that Abraham Lincoln had drunk and uh, I had to very gently and diplomatically let her know that the chocolate pot hadn't been made until about 40 years after his death. So, uh, but you know, unfortunately, those those stories just kind of grow as they you know, pass down through the family. And uh, sometimes, sometimes the stories are true. Sometimes they're not. We innovate, offering live event coverage via our website and on-demand streaming. There's a little a little flame stitch, little pocketbook, and it's from the 18th century. 
uh, presented to my grandmother by Indian Hannah. For, uh, last one of the something tribe. Oh, it might, it might be Tempe. Um, uh, something County, Pennsylvania. And it's dated 1764. So it is a wonderful little flame stitch, flame stitch wallet. So this has come down through your family since the 18th century? I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> an, an, a great aunt had it, and I, I have no idea where it came from, but I've looked up Indian Hannah, the last of that particular tribe. The last tribe. of that tribe, yes. And, and there's references to her? Yeah. Oh, and the, okay. And the date seems correct, and there's initials on there, the H. I've never heard of Indian Hannah, but here's a whole bunch of references to her. Seneca is what she was, uh, looks like. And it says, I think on there it says Lenny Lenape or something like that. But right, right, right. I've always just kind of wondered if that's true and if it's authentic. Well, I think it's probably true, but I think the more of the value lies in the fact that we have a, a, you know, a sewn a cloth wallet that's almost 300 years old here. Uh, so we can't prove India in the Hanna part, but we can prove the, the uh, stitched wallet. And I'm going to put in 18th century just to see what happens. Look at them all. So here is a grouping of very rem of remarkably similar stitched wallets, all from the 18th century. And what does it say about them? There's the interior of one, again. They're very, very similar. These look like they're in a little bit. This is getting closer in style to yours. Yeah, those look in better condition, certainly. Yeah, but you know what? I mean, 1764, that's, you know, 12 years before the American Revolution. So, so this whole grouping of stitched wallets from the 18th century uh, and we can probably find some more if we just take off the stitch. Let's see, so leather and sewn. That's very, very fancy. Embroidered love token wallet. I think that's what this is because it's dated and it has initials. So I think it's a love token wallet. There's that grouping again. There's some more there, 550. Canvas work, <coughs> wallets, late 18th century. Looks a lot like that. $550 for the pair. When did these sell? Oh, five years ago. So, so I'm still gonna say, even though it's rough, it has, it's dated. And um, it has the possible Indian Hannah connection. So uh, 150 maybe, maybe a little more. Hmm, interesting. Very cool. Thank you. You're welcome. It's Thanks kind of for a coming. Neat little thing. Yes. <laughs>
and the, the big showy candelabra on either side. Figured marble, very pretty. Oh, this is actually backwards. There we go. There we go. Um, so yes, it's, they're always French. Um, the, the figures, the candelabra and the, the figures on top of the clock are sometimes bronze. Sometimes they are um, uh, spelter. And spelter, yeah, that could be bronze. Uh, spelter is an inexpensive alternative to bronze. It's easy to cast, but it's very, very lightweight. And it gets very brittle. It's mostly zinc with a little lead and a little tin in it. So, so uh, does it run? Does the it, clock run? Uh, yeah, we do have the key for it. Uh, okay. My father took it in and had it repaired okay. at one time, but then it, it stopped working and, okay. and it hasn't worked since. It looks like someone whacked it with a hammer. Uh, did you see this? This uh, whole yeah. piece here has been broken off, yeah. and, and that's okay. That's okay. So we have a we have a French black marble garniture set with a figure of a of a of a of a courtier on top. So and they're all French, and they're all they all date from about 1880, 18. They're all 19th century. Um, it's, it's black with a clock. Garniture is the key word here. Look at them all. So you see, you'll have figures. I don't know, can everyone see it okay? Thank you. That's perfect. Right down there. There. So, so some of them get very elaborate. Uh, some of them are figure. There's one with a horse. A lot of them, some of them are gilt, like this one. Do you think we can find the same exact figure? That would be a long shot, but because there's a lot of them out there. They're very, very popular. They're very, you know, very attractive. They're not for everybody. I mean, they have to be able to work in the room. The ones that typically have these urns, I'll show you this one here. If you look at the urns on this one, and you look, see that very, very similar. The figuring in the marble here it's a little more, a little more colorful. Um, so, French marble garniture clock set. That's all you have to know. Uh, the clock is 16 and a half inches tall. Well, yeah, that one's a little taller maybe. Um, this set sold for 225 bucks. But it didn't have the figural motif. Um, and it has a little bit of damage. So you balance the beauty of the set with the damage to the clock. Um, they're usually eight day movements, so they only have to wind them once a week. Um, and, a, and a good clock guy is hard to find these days. Uh, just to go through it is going to cost about 150 bucks. Uh, and the, but they need to be clean, they need to be maintained. Um, so I mean, here we go. You can see that some of them, I mean this one very fancy, 450. This one phenomenal, 4,200 pounds. The last time I checked the pound was about $1.58. Uh, the pound and the euro are really, really down now. Um, here's one, a good comparable set, 450. You know, I'm going to say, because of the damage, probably about 300, 300 bucks for the whole set. But I'm so glad you brought this in, so that because I talk about garniture sets, and, and this just illustrates them very well. So, okay, thank, thank you. you. Well, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Buddy, look Buddy. at him. Not one, but two. So they're both, they're both engineer dolls. They are. Look at that. They are. They're so cute. how did these, how did these two little guys come into your life? I just think my aunt bought them for me. I think, I, I don't know. So, 
Uh, 50s? Probably, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Early 50s? I was born in 48. Yep. So, yep. and I think probably not long after that. It's, right? it's amazing to see them in this good a condition uh, because Buddy L uh, was a composition doll. And composition is a collector term for dolls that are made in a mold using uh, sawdust and glue and rags and ground up bone and all kinds of crazy things. Hand painted, he's always looking. He's always looking off to the side. Um, I know my daughter, when she comes to visit, I have to remove it because she said he creeps me up. That, and you know, that's a, a lot of them. There, there he is again. So, I mean, he's even got his little original neckerchief. Yeah. So you find Buddy, uh, Buddy Lee, um, dressed as engineers, as cowboy, as, have you seen many of these? No, okay. I have not. You're going to see a whole bunch of them right now. Have you, do you see a lot of them out there? Oh, yes. Oh, you do? Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, but usually not in this good a condition. Well, that's good. The arms move, too. I, I think that's kind of unique, isn't it? Yes, they're all jointed. Yeah. The legs don't, just the arms. So, my goodness, there they all are. <laughs> here he is right here, 1950s Buddy Lee. There you go. Here he is with his, and there he, the whole, the whole outfit there, 175 bucks. Oh. Can you believe that? That guy just sold in May. Here he is as a Coca-Cola delivery <laughs> man. <laughs> no, it's Coca-Cola, Coca 300 bucks. Wow. Here's the cowboy. Here he is with a lariat. Um, where's the little striped one? Here he is, Jiffy. Eight hundred dollars for oh, in his little jiffy outfit. Could I sell him a new outfit? And no, it wouldn't, <laughs> it wouldn't be the same. It wouldn't. Okay. Minneapolis Moline. Oh, wow. and he's a bus driver, I think. Yeah. Two seventy-five. Um, there again, Coca-Cola. Uh, Texaco. Oh, we are the men from Texaco. We work from Maine to Mexico. You remember that? <laughs> yeah. um, no, not really. uh, Standard Oil. Coca-Cola again. I'm looking for the stripe. A baseball player. I've never seen a baseball player, Buddy Lee, which is probably why it sold for two thousand five hundred dollars. There he is. Wow. Okay, so let's go back here now. <coughs> Phillips sixty-six. So they would. They would sell these in gas stations and in supermarkets mm -hmm. and in Coca-Cola. And sometimes they would give them away as premiums. The distributorships would give them away. Okay. Um, again, there's, there's the, that's not that's yeah that's that's not that's, striped though? that's that's not striped. It's not the striped oh. one. So I'm still looking for the striped engineer's outfit. Well, that's striped right there. And he's got his work, but he's got a work shirt on. Two ninety. Wow. Wearing original railroad overalls and hat. No scarf. There he is, right there. There he is. Yeah. Oh, he didn't sell. Oh. They were he estimating him. He wasn't him. yellow. <laughs> what? He wasn't yellow. Like he wasn't. <laughs> they were estimating him at three to four hundred, which I think is a little strong. Uh, but there he is, with the neckerchief and and, and everything. Him. Yep. There he is in the hat, his wonderful little hat. So I st I'm still going to say, you know, a hundred and a half. For both uh, or for which one? No, for each. Okay. Each, I would say. I mean, that first one that we looked at right there, he's also got a neckerchief, which this guy does not have. No. Uh, that was 175 I'm going to say about 300 for the pair. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Good to see you Good again. Good to see you, too. Okay. Um, gosh, you know, uh, growing up in Green Bay, um, uh, my favorite, uh, you know, hometown uh, memory has to do with my huge family. I'm the oldest of 11 children. And so as a result, uh, we didn't have any antiques and collectibles around the house. We, you know, my parents had no disposable income. It all went for feeding and clothing this, this tribe of kids. Uh, but I think the, the, my favorite memory has to do with the books that we got when we were kids on on history and on art. And I think that was really the beginning. My father was an artist. Uh, and, and I think that was the beginning of training my eye to spot color and form and 
you know, proportion and surface and all the things that you draw on when you're looking at antiques and collectibles. Uh, so we got, we got books on, on American Indians, on Native Americans, and we got books on, uh, on the history of the, the armed services, and we got books on horses, and we got you know, all kinds of wonderful books. And, on, and we always had books and music in the house. There was always a record playing, uh, and, and so I think that that's affected me more than anything else. All right, this was in my grandmother's, our grandmother's uh, house, above her, uh, this, the hutch that was built into sure, the wall. Sure, sure. And I just love it, and I have it, and I don't know anything about it. It's a really nice, um, folky, still life painting. Mm -hmm. The color, um, I thought the guy got the sunlight really well on that. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And it's signed R.S. Hayes in the foreground. I don't think that's anything that's going to come up in an artist database. But you know what? It's a, it, you can tell it's a folk painting because it's on a handmade stretcher. There are no holes for keys. We were talking about this earlier. So, so we have a compote piled high with grapes. You've got more grapes in the... You're right. Look at the way that the, the, the little highlights from whatever light source it is are, are picked up on the, on the peaches. It reminded me or, of Rembrandt's. Yeah. It was attention yeah. to the light. So, so it's a wonderful folk painting from the last quarter of the 19th century. So it's about 130 years old. It's pretty dirty. Yeah. It would benefit from a good cleaning. Where would you have that done at? I would have that Minnesota, done. Minnesota? I would have that done. No, Milwaukee. Okay. Uh, Landmarks Gallery. Uh, you can find them online, landmarksgallery.com. Monica Mull is the restorer there. This is a small painting. I mean, this is about, you know, this is about 12 by, you know, 16. Um, it would cost a few hundred dollars to have it clean. You don't need any in painting. Nothing else needs to be done. The canvas is still nice and taut. You know, it doesn't need to be restretched. It doesn't need to be lined. It just needs to be cleaned. You'll be shocked I'm sure. when you see it I'm at sure. the, at, because the, there's st so much color under all that grime and dirt. Um, and then then she'll varnish it, and it'll just shine. You know, it'll be it'll and be a good beautiful. To go with just a duster. Yes, exactly, exactly. So it's a really nice folk painting Excellent. of fruit. Worth, you know, four or five hundred bucks, um, yeah. and and it won't. I don't think it'll cost that much to have it cleaned. I just took her one that was. Uh, I'm trying to remember how big it was. It was a. It was about this size, except it was it was vertical rather than horizontal, and it was two hundred, uh, two sixty maybe. Now, do you send this whole thing to her? Yeah. I mean, it, like, you can just pack it up. Not call Express. <laughs> yeah, just, just just safely pack it up and ship it off to her. There, there's if if you wanted to do something in Minnesota, there's a there's an excellent uh, uh, you know resource in the Upper Midwest Conservation Association. They're atta attached to the uh, Minneapolis Institute of Arts, but they will charge museum prices. Right. For the they charge a lot of money. They do fabulous work, and it's worth it. But if if there are budgetary concerns, uh, and a lot of us have those. Um, you can have it. You can. She'll do. Monica will do a fabulous job on cleaning this. Are you writing this down, Pat? <laughs> she's got it all. She's got it all right in here. You know, I have, I have many, many programs coming up in eastern Minnesota, all around the Twin Cities area. Uh, I'll be doing programs very soon in Cannon Falls, and uh, I'll be back in Fridley in May, and uh, so I'm, I'm, you know, and many other programs. Scott County Public Libraries has just booked a couple events, but folks can see my complete calendar of travels on my website, and that's markfmoran.com.